This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Should we do the chapter? Yeah, let's do A Quiet Place. A Quiet Place and then The Breaking Storm. And The Breaking Storm. Storm. Yes, so The Quiet Place has the dark friend faces, which doesn't seem obvious at first until you realize Kareen is a dark friend and does that whole hood thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's she causes chaos. And I, I really do think that that is a clue, that that icon is supposed to be mm-hmm. a clue that there's dark friends doing stuff in this chapter, because that's the only clue I think we get. Yeah, I agree. And I, I would summarize this chapter as being terror, torture, and terror on That is this chapter, because we have the terror of the kin running around. We have the torture of Ispan by Adelius and Van Dien, and we have Elaine sorting out terror on and getting a lot, not just sorting them up, but getting a lot of the ones that we see come into play later in the plot. This isn't just her sorting. This is her finding things that cosplayers will be making for years to come. Like what's behind you, for example. A quiet place, which is what the they're hoping the farm is going to be. And it's really not because of all the chaos. It's almost an ironic uh, chapter. Yeah, it's what the farm mm-hmm. has been. It is not what the farm will be in the future, as of this moment. The kin's farm lay in a broad hollow surrounded by three low hills, a sprawling affair of more than a dozen large, white-plastered buildings with flat roofs, gleaming in the sun. Four great barns were built right into the slope of the highest hill, a flat-topped thing with one side that fell away in steep cliffs beyond the barns. A few tall trees that had not lost all of their leaves provided a modicum of shade in the farmyard to the north and east. Olive groves marched away and even up the sides of the hills. A sort of slow bustle enveloped the farm, with easily over a hundred people in evidence despite the afternoon heat, carrying on all the everyday tasks, but none quickly. It might almost have passed for a small village instead of a farm, except that there was not a man or a child to be seen. Elaine did not expect any. This was a waypoint for kinswomen passing through Ebudar to elsewhere, so there would not be too many in the city itself at one time. But that was a secret matter, as secret as the kin themselves. Publicly, this farm was known for two hundred miles or more as a retreat for women, a place for contemplation and escape from the cares of the world for a time, a few days, a week, sometimes longer. Elaine could almost feel serenity in the air. She might have regretted bringing the world into this quiet place, except that she also brought new hope. So that's the quiet place. Is this place that she's disturbing? It, it's funny. For such an important place, we're actually only here for a very short period of time. Yeah, for a few hours. It's a pivotal place, but it's a very brief moment. But it takes two chapters. Actually, it takes three chapters, I think, for them to get fully out of there. But yeah, it's in the timeline, it's only like an afternoon, basically late morning through mid-afternoon. So we run into Elise, who is sort of the one who runs the farm. Mm-hmm. She is like a foil for Nynaeve, I think, is the like literary term for that, because she does butt heads with Nynaeve and she does stand out from the kin for the fact that she's actually like on a level with Nynaeve, only way better at it. She's basically a wise one. She's kind of the Sorolea of the kin, right? Like every group of channelers has to have that one gotcha. woman. The one who's like takes charge and makes everybody else who's also strong willed fall into line. So she must be super strong willed on another level. Right. The Suan. Yeah. yeah. I, I see what you mean. Yeah. So Elise is that for the kin because everyone else has been like a shrinking flower, like all that kind of thing. And I'm being told that my use of the term foil is correct from someone who knows these things. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you, Fire Phoenix with the English major. I believe you have an English major. And get, I got that right. Yay. <laughs> Edit that so I sound like I know what my friends' stories are. So yeah, I that's basically Elise's role, and we're being introduced to her, and it's important if you enjoy watching that kind of sparring. That's about all there is to say about her. Her story isn't particularly interesting. She just provides a necessary function in the... She creates some physical comedy uh, in this, with her mm-hmm, interactions mm-hmm. with the sea folk. There's a lot of physical comedy that kind of breaks up the intensity. The, the, the where's stuff. my hat? Here's your hat. Like that sort of... The, the squawk like a startled goose when she, like, puts a noble woman into the barn to be quiet and stay out of the way. Like, there's levity there, and she provides a really nice 
antagonist against Rianne in terms of debating the future of the gotcha. kin because Rianne is really excited to like go back. You know, she's got Elaine's kind of enthusiasm for the tower and Rianne is more like Nynaeve. She's like Nynaeve right. in that. In that she's like, what? do you really want to be involved? Is the tower going to give you a choice? Like, and so Elise gives voice to that side of the argument. So the kin aren't all just automatons following after this idealism, there's actually a discussion happening. Well, I, you also see it. Elise is, from her point of view, already pretty much on the top of the heap, right? She's the most powerful of the kin, right? So they do what she says. Why would she want to join another power structure where she's got to start over and work her way up? Like, that's a whole, like, from a personal perspective, dude, why do I want to join the White Tower? I'd just be another apprentice when I when I'm the master and commander of everyone here? Like, no, no, I'm not giving that up. Yeah. You want me to be a perpetual novice when I have freedom as an adult ass woman? Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> so yeah, Elise provides a lot of important narrative functions. Mm -hmm. Um, but she doesn't have an interesting backstory, particularly. Uh she doesn't like turn out to be a dark friend or like save anyone in an epic way or die in an epic way. Or have She's any role just... in the last battle whatsoever besides the general kin healing group. Which is important. Yes. But yeah, she's not a thrilling character. She's just an important literary device <laughs> character. <laughs> and so as they're writing up, you know, it looks like this weird group of women until we get the dark friend Kareen leaving her hood too far back in a very dark friend. Just framing yes, her just face. Just perfectly. She's like, I tried to pull it up far enough. Oops. Oops. So that's that's the trick. That's how you know she's a dark friend. And if you're paying attention, yeah, he drops a lot of hints about that along the way. If you can keep all these characters straight, which we have trouble. Nope, yeah, but nobody can. can. <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah, the, there's that investigation of Vandy and Adelius. And we see a lot of them in this. And really, this is what leads to their deaths, right? Because Vandy and Adelius are the ones who take control of Ispawn. And then because they're the ones in control, one of them gets murdered. Yep. When, when they take control of this, they sign one of mm -hmm. their death warrants. Which it's it's the way that their relationship works. It's basically a death warrant for both of them because they are like right. warders because they're literal sisters. And do you remember the mnemonic device I used to keep them straight? Vandine is, Van is a green, and so she doesn't die because she's got the warders. And so she doesn't die because she's got the warders. Yeah, I forgot the second part. <laughs> I just remember the mnemonic part. Because because the dark friend doesn't want to kill because the warders would have tipped them off, and they they speculate that's mm -hmm. why she survived. They waited. Yeah. The women all scatter like hens when a fox is in the coop. Like, it's just absolute chaos. And then Nynaeve is just making it worse. I love worse. her reaction. <laughs> Stop them. The last thing we want is a panic. Send the warders. <laughs> like, <laughs> Send men on horseback <laughs> in armor. Don't no, run them down. We don't want to panic. <laughs> <laughs> what? it's oh, so God, like Jesus. it's hilarious yeah. it's, i love land's response with a nod that seemed to be a shake of his head <laughs> <laughs> so he started to shake of his head like yes honey <laughs> it's not gonna be a good thing <laughs> land raised a questioning eyebrow and we all know i mean he does not make much of an expression. So to raise a whole questioning eyebrow, that's like Land basically being uh, yeah. like, what the fuck are you doing, woman? Like, are you <laughs> kidding me? Exactly. But he's Land, so he goes and does it. He's like, she knows that I disapprove. It's fine. Oh, my God. It's hilarious. But yeah. Then... Those, the interaction between those two in these chapters is just so such a fun background you know, when people say Jordan doesn't build relationships well, I'm like, go reread the, the this stuff with Lan and Nynaeve after they get back together. <laughs> so cute. Yeah, it's it's great. Um, but Elise does not run around mm -mm. in a panicked fashion. Uh, Elise decides to tear Rianne a new one. <laughs> Be like, I swear to. The light, I will I will beat you, I will call you out. How dare you sell us out? Like she just goes off on Rihanna. Rihanna's like, I can explain, I can explain. Rihanna's like, I don't want to yeah. fucking hear it. But Rihanna, Rihanna's a good point. They already know, right? Like, how am I not keep I'm not keeping a secret when they're coming to me and like, so we know who you are, we know what you've been doing. Right. It's not like they she like I didn't tell them anything. They came to me and But Rihanna doesn't give Rihanna doesn't no. get a chance. Elise does mm -hmm. not give her a chance at all. And then until the Aes Sedai are like, No, you you should listen. We 
to, and then Elise is like, well, fuck everything. <laughs> like Elise is very stymied by this because she does not want to be told that she's not good enough again. Yeah. What what will we go back for? To be told again we aren't strong enough and to be sent on our way? Or will they just keep us as novices for the rest of our lives? Some might accept that, but I won't. What for, Rianne? What for? And, like, that's a legitimate question because I don't Extremely. don't think it's one that Egwene has answered. She's like, I want you back as part of the tower. But she never she hasn't figured out what the kin are going to be um, until we talk about them retiring into the kin and possibly as healers. You know... Essentially, I think of the kin as what the yellow Aja should have been. Basically. You know? With a hint of the gray, because they can help with traveling. And the gray, honestly, would be great travelers, because they're diplomats. Like, they've got frequent flyer miles. It would seem that know? the gray would should be in control. Of, I mean, that's we can spec. I think we've done that before, but, like, what, what are the Aja's going to be in the new age? Oh, yeah, yeah for like, sure. The but... gray is the traveling one. The yellow is an actual, like, healing network. All that sort of stuff. The red is the ambassadors to the uh, the man who can channel. For sure. Yeah. The green to hunt down the remnants of the Trollocs. The next thing I have is Nynaeve just being like like one of those people like where she's so strong she doesn't understand what it's like to be weak. Because mm. she's like, I don't understand why you have to be a certain strength if you can pass the full tests. Like, I don't see what strength matters, says the strongest person in the room. There's some of that, yeah. But it's also legit. Yeah, it, it's a legit complaint, but coming from her... <laughs> In her bullish, <laughs> bullying, not reading the room sort of way. It's like, you should sit down and There's a little bit of that, but yeah. But but also, like, you need... What was the quote when I was... Uh, I think this was Russell Brand. When I was poor and I complained about wealth inequality, they told me I was jealous. When I was rich and complained about wealth inequality, they told me I was, you know, uh, I didn't have standing or something like that, basically. And it's like, just because she's powerful, it doesn't mean her point about power shouldn't matter or isn't valid. Yeah. And in a lot of a lot of ways she has to be powerful to change the status quo. For sure. But there's a little bit of like of all people to say that. <laughs> and also like she almost gets killed in the fool tests. She's totally writing them off. And it's like mm -hmm. I mean, if you're gonna lose your braid to those fool <laughs> tests. Like <laughs> don't sneer at them so hard. They're gonna kick your ass. I uh, the losing of the braid is so symbolic to me in terms of her like mm -hmm. growing up and losing the braid. In a lot of ways, I think Egwene grows up faster, and her losing her braid faster is a rep representation of that. And the fact that Nynaeve holds on to hers, which is sort of a representation of the two rivers, and I know it's supposed to represent being an adult in the two rivers, but I feel like out in the real world, it represents the opposite of like holding on to your childhood and your habits from the village you came from which don't matter anymore and shouldn't bind you and shouldn't force you to braid your hair right well especially with her i mean the fact that she literally clings to it yeah <laughs> yeah no, that's, that's a good way to put it yeah she literally clings to her home home yeah yeah so yeah it's i i totally agree that their their hair mirrors their maturity journey mm -hmm. i do hate though that there's that element of like she changes her hair and then she's an adult Kind of like ugh, hate the visuals of that. But... I mean, Perrin does it too. Well, he changes his beard, and that's how he becomes an adult. He grows, he grows a, beard. a beard. Yeah, but it's still a hair change, right? Like that's yeah, yeah. Uh, it it's not yeah. gendered. I don't think. I think it's just a a, a representation of like how often do you see that? Uh, I'm I'm even thinking of the last Airbender when we see like. Oh, I'm not familiar enough not, with but it. To... When we see Ang like shave his head after taking you know uh, taking a break, and he grows his hair back out again. But it's forced on her. She doesn't choose to do it. Both the examples you're citing are where a man chooses to change his hair. And it's like that I'm fine with. But the whole concept of like losing it violently, it's it's mm. I don't know. I don't like the visuals of it, Fair. but it's a it's a really to have her lose her braid. It's like a character dying. Right, right. Which there's not enough of in the series. So I did appreciate it <laughs> for giving me that like, oh, no, we've lost a favorite character. <laughs> but I do think there's, there's something to be said for going through the actual Aes Sedai testing and how that affects her and how that changes her. Right. It's, it is yeah. something that does change her. So, you know, it's a visible, it's a visible scar. scar of that change. Oh. Especially as shit's escalating, you need something very obvious to remind you of what she's been through. And the loss of her braid is like... So maybe a closer analogy wouldn't be Perrin growing his beard so much as Matt losing an eye. Yeah. Yeah, very... I mean, technically he consents to it, but only because the world is on exactly. the line. Exactly, yeah, like... yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's not really consent. That's... <laughs> yeah, not really. 
consent at the point of a gun. You can't sign a contract at yeah. the point of a gun type situation. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, no, just the, the violent removal of something that is, you know, sacred to you and really yeah. isn't recoverable. Well, her hair is more recoverable than his eye. Yeah, uh, on some level. But on another level, like, if you think it's long enough and, and dense enough, it could have taken her whole life to grow it out. And it's one of those things where, like, there's no real way to grow it out in a reasonable amount of time yeah. again. Like, it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we don't, yeah. Elise doesn't believe that they're eyes to die until the other eyes to die say mm -hmm. they are, which pisses them off. And then if there are 20 sea folk this far from the sea, really? I'll believe yeah. anything. <laughs> and then there's my one of my favorite interactions with the sea folk, which is go ahead and heal them if they ask politely. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then later in the chapter, they're all still they're all still hurting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> none of them ask politely. And this is just that one of those little subtle like you, you see it in three points where she goes, they may ask for healing and she goes, go ahead and heal them if they ask nicely. And then later. It's great. And then Elise takes charge of Nynaeve. Mm -hmm. Or and vice they go versa. Off and start having their little foil thing. And then the second that Elaine's back is turned, Ispan is where everyone wants her, which is with the eyes to die rather than the kin. How, how did they pull that off? Was it just like, give, give her to us? Over the entire last chapter, that was the entire argument, was each side taking their turns going to her and saying, we want her. So... They both know that the other wants the same thing, right? Like, the second that Elaine's back was turned, everyone was like, we're making this swap. I think it's funny. You spend that whole, yeah, we spent that whole chapter arguing back and forth, and it, in the end, doesn't matter. Because they go ahead and yeah. do it anyway. Yeah. Which, of course, sets up the death of Vandine and Adelius. Right. So. First Adelius, and then Vandine. Basically, yeah. They, good job. You guys killed yourselves. Probably shouldn't have taken that task on. But, like, I mean, at the same time, who else in their minds is better qualified to interrogate a Black Aja sister than themselves? They're like, we're the oldest, most badass eyes to die in this group. It has to be us. Yeah, and, and all that valuable knowledge that they got out of her really, really paid off, didn't it? I'm so glad that they took that over because they really... That's the really <laughs> frustrating part. They got Nothing. 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 There was no point. She's she sworn an oath not to betray, right? We all know that. Like we all we read the text, right? Like they learn that there's oaths from the dark one. Ooh, such a shock. Come on, you knew that there were gonna be dark oaths. That was not enough knowledge to have two eyes to die and one warder? One warder? At least die? No. Yeah, it's just so they were such good characters and they just die in the most pointless stupid thing. But yeah, that's what we're setting up next, is when Elaine and Aviander are like, we can do the tortures! And Natalie's and Vandine are like, you sweet summer no. children, no you can't. <laughs> Get out of here. And then Elaine's like, oh my god, wow! And Aviander's like, yeah, I just don't know how to torture. So. There's a line here where there's the two white-haired sisters have linked and are shielding Ispan. And she says, not even one of the Forsaken could have broken it. And I'm like, that can't be true right rand was shielded actively by three linked women plus the 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 rest well i guess he broke through the rest of the knots but he was actively shielded by three women when he, he broke through and stilled them in the box and the forsaken are at least many of the forsaken are very close to as powerful as he is so maybe no female forsaken but certainly the male forsaken cannot be shielded by only two Aes Sedai. yeah I would agree with that. It's probably one of those things of hubris where they just don't quite understand how it works at the higher levels because that's not really a thing that they have to deal with. So they just assume that they know what's going on and then they, they don't actually know. They just don't get the power level that the Forsaken are actually at. But but yeah, yeah. it's just one of those things. That just, it just seems one of those like statements that's like, you know, if you really thought about that, it's not technically true. Yeah, it's it's mm -hmm. not, but they mm -hmm. believe it to be true. It's one of those things that, like, not even an elephant could break it if they sat on it. And it's like, well, yeah, no, probably if an elephant actually sat on my computer, it would break. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. one of those things, like, right. uh, maybe it's a hyperbolic statement more than anything else, but. Yeah, I have a couple of things highlighted here. Um, there's the saying from their father reminding us that they're blood sisters. Mm -hmm. It's better to be sure than to weep later. Mm. That's That's. They're so careful and they have so much history and then they die because they do this thing. And then there's this other line. Once the White Tower touched you, it was never finished. Yeah. There is no getting away. They say that it's not done with you until it's done with you, but they're never done with you. 
It's just like the White Tower is a very insidious institution. I can see why some women maybe don't want to just leap straight into it. Makes sense. So then we get this description about exactly how interrogation has to work according to Tower Law. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, just the he- it is interesting. Um, before the session begins, healing had to be given, and then the questioning started after sunrise. It had to end before sundown. If after sunset, then before sunrise, which is basically like you had twelve hours and you got to heal them. You know, max. You can't. Uh, you can't break any bones. You can't shed their blood. You can't basically torture people. And you can't use sidar mm-hmm. on initiates of the tower. But on non-initiates, you can, which is interesting. But on non-initiates, you can. Yeah. And it seems to me like this rule gets broken a lot because it's all in their heads. And this is more of a rule, less of this is a tower rule, not it's not an oath, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's one of those things where. And it's like the rules gets broken a lot, partially because order is breaking mm-hmm. down at this time in the in the narrative. Perhaps that was less common a hundred years ago. It's I always wonder what exactly it is that um, Adelius and Van Dien do to Isfan. It's definitely a figs and mice sort of writing technique where it's like he just doesn't tell you, and you have to imagine mm-hmm. it and produce it. And you're like, I need to stop thinking about this because I don't I don't even want to know what my imagination is going to do next. Oh, I did want to jump back a little bit to a line that she's thinking about the ageless face. And she says, oh, what you would not give to have the ageless face already. That tweaked a thread in the back of her thoughts, but it vanished as soon as she tried to examine it. Well, she's just encountered a whole group of channelers who are quite old and not a single one of them has the ageless face. So something mm-hmm. something about that has got to be like, wait, why don't any of these people have an ageless face? Something in her mind is saying that, even though she can't bring that to consciousness yet. She's picking up on what leads to the Oathron mm-hmm, discussion. Definitely. Um, and they're questioning Ispan right now because she's been on drugged with fork root and it's starting to wear off. So Ispan is sort of conscious and awake. So before they douse her again, basically, they're like, this is the time to ask her questions. Yeah. And Elaine marches up and is like, what are you doing? Oh, hi, I'm going to commit war crimes. I'll just submit myself for penance after. <laughs> it's like the way that she goes from not knowing what's happening to being like, please leave so that I can inexpertly mm-hmm. torture this woman is just like, Elaine, could you please stop and think about something for once? Could you please, please think through what you are doing? Because that makes no sense. I am. It, this makes no sense. You are not qualified. We should talk. Aside from the fact that torture doesn't get accurate right, answers. Yeah, we can, Aside oh, from let's that. Let's not even bring that up. Yeah, I mean, we, we can talk about the morality of, of, like, it doesn't seem like this torture is worth it. You don't get any decent information. It's like, and, and, and those rules are in place for a reason, right? Because, like, you're better off befriending somebody to try and convince them to give you information than torturing them. They're probably using, like, intimidation weaves or something. Like, they're probably staying within tower law rules, but, like, the entire... The entire thing where Elaine thinks that her and Avienda can just physically torture the woman. It, it's just like, no, stop. Stop thinking that. I mean, there is a certain, the the oath is relaxed a little bit because she is a dark friend. And there is like, you can use the power as a weapon against a dark friend if you know they're a dark friend. So there's a certain amount of relaxing of, of, of rules. And, you know, I could see someone convincing themselves, well, since we know they're Black Aja, they're not technically an initiate of the tower anymore. No, they are well, still. yeah. According to the way that the Aes Sedai see it, like, they see them as a betraying initiate of the tower. So it's... But Elaine's just, like, leaping right through all this and just being like, I can just decide this and no one's going to question me and she's got these quotes from her mother and Lainey where it's like oh if you pay the price and you can do whatever you want it's just like even a queen isn't above the law which i mean if if they're i i agree that you should probably obey the rules of the nation you're ruling right be really the world would probably be a better place if our rulers had to um follow the rules that the rest of us do you'd think the world would probably be run a bit differently if they were actually held to the same rules that we were if, if there's a fee for breaking the law, then that law only exists for poor people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. If a pay-to-play judiciary. Anyway. Um, Moving on. There's, there is one little echo of Game of Thrones here, which is when <clears throat> what you order done, you must be willing to do with your own hand. As queen, what you order done, you must have you have done. Right? And there's some, a little bit of Stark in that, where he cuts off the guy's head himself. Yeah. And it's basically yeah. like... If you can order an execution, be ready to cut off the guy's head yourself. I don't remember the exact quote, but there's a sort of a similar yeah. 
being a good king yeah. is all about like being in charge and, and, and being willing to take action yourself. On some level, yes, but at the same time, it's like, I want to order an engineer to build a bridge for me. I probably, as king, shouldn't build that bridge myself, right? Like, there's a certain amount of skilled right. work labor that goes into it that's, like, not a willingness, but a skill. That's something that Athenael thinks about in the prologue, mm. is, uh, like, she is not going to attempt to do what any soldier can do. She's not going to learn how to use a sword, because that's what soldiers do. She's going to learn how to rule a country. Because that's her job. Elaine definitely doesn't think that because she runs into a battle with a sword. Well, in fairness, it's the actual end of everything. There is that, but yeah. You know. You know, she wasn't doing it before. But yeah, it's um Elaine has a hard time learning that lesson, and Athenael really has internalized that and gives us that in the prologue. <laughs> what I find uh what I found with this series is that Jordan often has a theme to each book. And I feel like this book, we're really talking about, whereas the last book really delved into consent, this one really talks about the responsibility of power. Everything from using the Bull of the Winds and, and this conversation that we're having now to Rand and Kalindor and the way he goes rogue and actually accidentally kills his own army, um, which is a big, you know, part of this thing. Having too much power. How can it go wrong? <laughs> right. That that Like, all of a sudden, our characters that we've seen be these nobodies are really big and in charge we've seen our main characters our former queens our former amarillon seats humbled and we have these these inexperienced characters rising up with power for the first time making mistakes trying out torture for the first time trying out leading an army for the first time and this book is all about what's gonna go wrong mm -hmm. i like that that is that is a theme we will look <laughs> out for as it undoubtedly pops up again and again throughout the book power gone wrong power gone yeah. wild Woo! <laughs> show us your angry all <laughs> yes yes um so then silent glances pass between van Dien and adelius in the manner of people who had spent so much time together they hardly needed to speak aloud any longer which i like that's always because cute, yeah. it just i mean it breaks your heart a little more when they die but like it's that's how close they are like that's they don't they're they're almost water bonded to each other. They really mm -hmm. are. They can almost read each other's minds. They can almost tell where each other are. They really can't exist if the other dies. Well, and let's go back to uh, I'm guessing they've healed each other multiple times over the years. Mm -hmm. So you know mm -hmm. we, we talked about mm -hmm. how naive maybe she knew where Lan was because of the healing sensibility. Maybe some of this connection between them is the the fact that they've healed each other and know where the other person is at all times and that and then to just like constantly that. being associated with the other person as well with the, any relationship that lasts hundreds of years, right? Like <laughs> hundreds. hundreds. You know, imagine an old married couple just multiplied by many many times van Dien takes them outside and is like we got mm -hmm. this don't worry about it and we get this little bit of physical comedy of elise and nynaeve like shoving women into the barn with loud squawks and all this stuff while this like very serious conversation about like how to commit war crimes smart in a smart way uh happens that's one of the things that, that to me kind of cheapens the the can a little bit is like just have them file into the barn you really have to have Nynaeve picking them up by the scruff of their neck and, like, thrusting them in. That, that to me, is one of the... Well, it's the noble women who are trapped there alongside yeah, the kin. Yeah. But, yeah, it's all part of the same mm -hmm. smear. But it is technically not the kin. It's technically all the people who Got are it. the screen, the public side of the, of the thing. So, gives them a small, small break. And so, yeah, then she goes back inside and drops a ward of, against eavesdropping. And Elaine's like... Well, now I'm extra disturbed. Let's go sort more to our Because eavesdropping isn't necessarily what they were trying to keep. Any they didn't, they didn't. They wanted you not to be able to hear the screams, is what they're implying there. But, like, is that what they're doing? Or is it something else? Like Adelius and Van Dien, dark friends, as well. Totally. Because, I mean, if you look at the header, right, isn't that the dark friend symbol? So, mm -hmm. it's, it, you know, maybe they're the ones who are the dark friends in this chapter. You never know. Yeah. They could be just putting up a silence barrier, not torturing her at all. They didn't get any useful information, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. I think there's a very legitimate argument to be made, at least up, you know, until we find out later, that Van Dien is the dark friend, and that her sister found mm -hmm. out and she killed her, right? So how often do we hear that that dark friends kill their siblings or kill family mm -hmm. members or loved ones unexpectedly? And I think it would have been just awesome and really a good divergent. <laughs> 
to actually have uh, you know one of the sisters be a dark friend and the other one not even though they've been together that long i think that would have been a really interesting plot device that would have been rough that time where she's like skinny and trying to hunt down the killer that's actually because she's like being ridden by one of the forsaken to accomplish something and she's desperately trying to accomplish it and she can't and all that kind of stuff like <laughs> uh, for a long time i thought that that's how that plot line was going to resolve before they they uh -huh. find the dark friend i was like oh it's going to be the sister it's going to be the other one that's going to be so cool uh -huh. so uh -huh. i was kind of disappointed it wasn't because that's that was my headcanon before the reveal of who the who the dark friend was so i think in this in this case there's an indication of that right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. totally i i can totally see it and then you've got two dark friends and one non-dark friend in the tent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this goes up with my um van that van is also forsaken Right, like things yeah. that we know aren't true, but like could have been made, made sense, sense. Yeah, as at the going time. Along. Yeah, yeah, no, you can make a good conspiracy out of it. Totally. So yeah, then we get some uh, Elise disrespecting Renaila, mm -hmm. which is funny, but whatever. And then we get to the sorting of Terangriol, I think, which is the the most interesting part of this particular chapter. Yeah, because now we actually get some of the goods. Uh, it was interesting though that Avienda, yes, she did help search, but we don't get her little like reading even though she's touching a bunch of the angriol and tarangriol in this case she's not reading any of them i think she's starting to feel them and it it crystallizes into knowledge later like the skill like starts here but it just starts with her feeling something and not knowing what it is that's how i kind of interpret it but it was interesting to me that there is it not necessarily a plot hole but so much as i think that may, may be more of a sanderson was like oh i need to give her this skill because i need to describe what these tarangriol are because i don't think she necessarily had it before well, right, but she does have something, right? Because she, like, holds the the dull knife sure. and like, gets really sucked into it and kind of, like, Frodo with the ringed about it. And, like, it's there's something there, and then it develops. Mm -hmm. So we saw them doing this a little bit in the last one. She, The brooch, the turtle brooch. And I was wrong. I thought that that's the one that she gave to Avienda, but that's incorrect. It's actually the, the woman. Mm -hmm. She gives the brooch to exactly. Talon. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, so we got a necklace and bracelets. Set with colored stones, not joined by chains. I'm learning because of my meticulous note taking. There's actually two sets of hand jewelry here. This is a necklace and bracelets and a belt and finger rings, right? So this is, but none of that is connected by a chain because these are all Terran real. Mm -hmm. So this is her paralysis net, essentially. Yeah, the the belt is a well. Mm -hmm. Did you see her using that? But yeah, I think a lot of these end up getting dispersed to... No, it's all one it's set. It's all one set. And and Nynaeve wears it, yeah. Nynaeve wears most of that for most of the series. Every single one was a turn. We're only all matched and they're meant to be worn together. And Elaine's like, why would you want to be totally suited up? And it's like, have you seen Iron Man? <laughs> have you seen Batman? Yeah. Have you seen any action flick ever? Everyone wants to be wearing all the cool shit all at once. That is absolutely a thing that a magic person would also do. Also, hang out with Codswain. There's a reason she's a badass. It's because she's got one mm -hmm. of those. So the next thing is the dagger with the gold wire wrapped around the hilt of Deerhorn with a dull blade. And that we see used in the last battle. She gives that to Rand. Rand takes that into Sheol Ghul, and that's how he surprises the Dark One. Because that hides. Because it hides you from the Dark One's eyes. From the Dark One's sight. Somehow she figures that out. And it fascinates her now, and she clues in on that later. I wonder if it's a feeling of like safety or something like that. Like being in a setting. I was thinking the eye of the world space, but yeah, same idea. Then there's a list of a bunch of stuff that aren't even necessarily Terangriol, but probably are. I mean, finger rings, earrings, necklaces, bracelets, and buckles, statues and figures of birds and animals and peoples, several knives that have, had, have edges. Those could all just be valuable things, like rings and earrings. Half a dozen large medallions, hats made of metal. Well, those, we know what those are. Oh, what are those? Well, because Avienda goes through and diagnoses what a lot of these are That's later. Right. These helmets are how they controlled show wings. Oh, okay. They were like pilot's helmets. Yeah, kind of like the flying machines in uh, His Dark Materials, actually. I think that's how I imagine them. It's like these fine helmets that they can then control this like power living thing. Because she says later it has to it has to do with directing a thing that flies. And she doesn't make any sense to her. But like to me, it's... oh. It's a showing helmet. It's a showing pilot interface. Rather than having controls, they had a brain interface, basically. Mm hmm Cool. Basically. Which makes yeah. sense. I mean, if you can do compulsion, that means you can clearly read what's in the brain, you know, delving and stuff like that. Like it, it, yeah. yeah, exactly. With that you just wire that up with a very specific kind of uh, user interface, and you can fly showings. 
And I so I think that she must diagnose some of this other stuff later. Um, but that's the only one that I remember. That is the only one that like this is the only one with any like finger rings, earrings, and necklaces, bracelets, and buckles. Those could be anything. Like we don't we don't. There's yeah. no specific. And they never come up. And then, and then, <laughs> the red the rod. smooth red rod. <laughs> a rod, thick as a wrist, bright red and smooth and rounded, firm rather than hard for all that seemed to be stone. It almost felt hot. <laughs> if someone said, describe a penis, this is, a, you know, describe a penis, a rod, thick as your wrist, I mean... Well, wow. depending on the size of wrist. Yeah, okay. I think, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining Elaine has very dainty wrists. Yeah, she's not that much no. taller than I am. Yeah. And my wrists haven't grown in a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> not in that direction. You know, bright red and smooth and rounded. like. And it, you know, it feels hot right. and it makes her think of fire. And then everyone laughs hilariously when she thinks of fire later when they're traveling. Uh -huh. And everyone just won't stop laughing at her. And then later we get the drunk enough to dig, take your clothes off and dance on a table reference. Mm hmm. Yep. Because she basically went as she became a stripper and like did like a pole dance or something like on a table, like something like mm -hmm. that um, in response to this rod, because this is clearly a um, aphrodisiac to on Grail <laughs> or something. I, Age of Legends, I said I were kinky. That's all we're gonna say. Yeah, like they lived a long time and they had a lot of power and resources. And when you have too many resources, you be, get a very kinky society. I mean, that's right. Don't doms all say that their clients are high powered? Like, mm -hmm. men I mean, as a rule, in, yeah, as a, as a general, general rule, yeah. So just imagine I said I, you know, being that to the nth degree. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's a sex toy. I mean, you know Elida likes being tied up. That's all I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's a sex toy. It comes up quite, you know, a couple more times. It's a shame it it's, doesn't get used in the amazing. last battle. Yeah. That would be an interesting way to disable a Forsaken. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Grandal. <laughs> no, Grandal would be a bad choice. Yeah, I know. Because she'd just be like, this is she'd fine. She'd be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is so tame. <laughs> <laughs> Normal Tuesday. Next is uh, metalwork basket balls, one inside another. A metal basket work of balls. One. So this to me looks like, is basically a fractal. Yeah, and it makes music. A three dimensional it's fractal. Like... That well, yeah, just and and I imagine the the shifting around inside is just. I imagine it's just a pleasant toy. Yeah. Someone, but the whole like going down to infinity is kind of cool. Yeah, and then a blacksmith's puzzle made of glass never comes up again. No. Seems like it must be a turn grill. It's a very weird object, but. I imagine if you unlocked it, it might do something interesting. Maybe, maybe that's a stasis chamber, or what? What are they mm -hmm. called that the the golem was in? Stasis, stasis box. Stasis box. Maybe that's like, and unlocking it is how you open it. Yeah, totally. We just don't know. Or it could be a to another toy. Yeah, the gore could be another toy because it does look like there's some toys in here too, right? Like, and that makes sense. Like, if you're making Taron Grail, why not make toy Taron Grail? Totally. And then two more on Grail, which is nice. We get more power to drive the bowl with. And then we get the golden bracelet attached to finger rings. That is the picture behind you. Which is one of those two on real. So she's two more. It's the, the, the finger rings and the woman, uh, the amber woman. Yeah. Yes. Yes. These are the two on real that she finds that make a really big difference in how several battles go moving forward. But yeah, the seated woman in age darkened ivory like wrapped in her hair and all of that in this like very uh, Buddha pose kind of thing. It's like a very, uh, you know, she's got like what her one hand is with the two fingers together. Then the other hand is like up. I forget how it's described, but it feels like the eye of the world to me. The age darkened ivory description is like, you really only see stuff described like that for Tarangriol in the eye of the world. And it just, it feels like a very eye of the world esque. Item. I was just reading the, the chapter where she, identifies things to see if there's anything else that was identifiable a black and white figurine of a bird with long wings and spread and flies for talking to people a long way off so is a blue figure of a woman as well as numerous rings earrings and bracelets so that's appears what those are is so everything she describes is ultimately determined to be true because yeah she has this whole pile mm -hmm. of stuff that she can't identify so it's all terangriol and it's just the little bits of tech that age of legends people wore about them interchangeably Basically, it's a bunch of Apple watches. <laughs> I mean, that's what people like, right? Jordan knew the future. 
Okay, so nothing else. There's there's a whole list of other things that she goes through, but nothing else really appears. Is I mean, we we talked about the flexible black rod. We talked about the metal helmets. We talked about the ivory box. There's the bracelet with the tiny lock with the key that can be taken off that goes with the the thing that's behind you. That's the Angriel, yeah. That never comes up again. I assume it's just a way to safeguard the Angriel so that no one else can take it off of you. Or use it without your permission, like you keep the key on it and no one else, uh, like, that way. It won't change to fit mm-hmm. them or right. attune to them, to use a and d term. Because it does, it, it, it fits her perfectly, which we assume it doesn't. That's just a magical property of these these wearable Terran Creoles, that they magically fit whoever puts them whoever on. Whoever puts it on, it right. fits. But if you took that part off, maybe it wouldn't. It would be like, no, I want my master. <laughs> it's time to cleanse the world from summer. It's time to restart the season. Yes. This is a slightly longer chapter, yeah. but this is chapter five, The Breaking Storm, and our symbol is the Lion of Andor, because this is from Elaine's POV. And they take off running to Andor. That's true. At the end, because they use the Bull of the Winds, turn around and witness the Shan Chan attacking Evudar, and take mm-hmm. off to Andor as a result. It's a very, Elaine's arc in many ways starts here. Elaine's next big arc, not her whole arc. And the breaking storm, I mean, it references both they break the the summer, right? Summer is broken, the backbone of that. But also the storm that Nynaeve refers to a lot is that was coming was the Sean Chan. Yep, the Sean Chan invasion proper. But basically, they're in a very flat place. I, and again, if you've ever been in the southeast, U.S. south. East. there's a lot of flat land a lot of swamp like areas you know you get up on the slightest rise and you can see forever because it's the only hill in any direction in anywhere and so this is this feels very familiar to me sort of looking over the swamp land that then goes into the sea just just yeah that sort of the gulf coast of the the country feels very much like this to me mm, that's a part of the country i've never been to then just the weather as well, just like that humid heat, sultry, sticky, yeah, yeah, sultry in quotes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's real. I mean, I, Abu Dhabi is New Orleans to me. Like I just, I, I feel that in my bones. Um, and this, this reinforces that view to me. They, they get up one little hill. Yeah, one little hill, and they've got a marvelous view because it's the only little hill. Um, the land was really quite flat here, except for those few hills. Abu Dhabi just out of sight to the south, even if she embraced the one power. So basically, and that's the coast. And so mm-hmm. they can see all around them. Nynaeve is pissed that they wasted an hour looking for powerful kin because none of the kin were powerful enough except for the one, I think. But yeah, they find one woman at the at the farm and she is one of the very first women that they recovered because she's one of the two who are actual runaways who ends up breaking psychologically mm. from the strain of being around eyes to die and goes back to being a novice 400 years after running away. And... So she passes out repeatedly from terror, so she didn't get very far away. So they spent a whole hour looking for her when she was right there behind them, just needing smelling salts. So Nynaeve is very, very grouchy. She's comedically grouchy, this whole chapter. At this point, the wooden, the, the, she ends up giving the Angriol, the woman, to Avienda, the bracelet and rings to Nynaeve, and the amber turtle to Talon. So she actually doesn't keep any for herself. No, she doesn't. Mm-mm. But she gives them no, she... to the three most powerful... Oh, yeah. Of channels. Well, maybe Avienda might not be, but Avienda's up there, you know? Yeah, Avienda's up there and she really wants to cheer Avienda up. But yeah, so to Nynaeve and Talon, because they are the strongest. Mm-hmm. I, I think she was going to keep the seated woman on Rial for herself. And then right. she was, just gave it to Avienda to cheer her up. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Marilil has started to have her tumultuous relationship with the Seafinder, with the, when, with the Sea Folk at this point. Mm-hmm. That has started her interaction with them since we last saw them has has begun that she's now looking at them and like twitching like just a little bit like that dynamic is officially moving. There's there's a certain amount of respect and lack of respect and, and, and just people trying to figure out where they stand on the social pecking order that's going on here. And people are realizing that the reverence they held for the Aes Sedai is kind of pointless. Yeah. And the Aes Sedai are super not okay with that. <laughs> it's, you know, the whole, like, we're a different flesh. We're special. We're demigods. We're near immortal. Like, the, it, it's why the Age of Legends was not actually a utopia. It, it, and that leads into this sort of interesting story about an Aes Sedai getting cheated by uh, a mm-hmm. Dumani and a Atha Anmier. Which I think just, in one way, it's like, oh yeah, the Aes Sedai clearly got cheated 
But at the same time, you're still comparing yourself to Aes Sedai. They are still the gold standard of being clever. It's like, how do you prove that you're clever? You cheat in Aes Sedai. No, you don't cheat in Atha on Mir. You don't cheat a Damani. Right. Right. Cheat in Aes Sedai. That's how you prove you're clever. Which I guess in a lot of ways, because there's consequences to, you know, (laughs) cheating Aes Sedai more so than anybody else. But yeah, it's just an interesting. I'm not really sure what the point of it is other than it's just it's a weird thing to recall at this point. People want to believe that Aes Sedai are human. And to tell a story like that is dangerous because they can blast your ass, but it is still true. <laughs> like, they are still human. We do hear that not a lot of people tell jokes about Aes Sedai, just because mm-hmm. it can be dangerous. Or they think yeah. it can be dangerous. Yeah, which it isn't, really. I mean, maybe a little bit, but... Yeah, so then Avienda gets all, like... My honor will cause me to suicide because I'm prickly. And Elaine being like, could you chill? Could you just, just chill? This it's very much imposter syndrome. <laughs> Reminds me of the conversations I had before you record Broken Earth. Yeah. Where you're like, I can't do this properly. I have shamed you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, like, no, it's ab- absolutely. And I'm like, no, So much empathy. Yeah, no, you're, you're fine. You're great. What are you talking about? You, you're saying you can't do something you shouldn't be able to do. Why are you ashamed about this? Let's walk back from the edge and just <laughs> get this over with and do the thing we came here to do instead of agonizing over not being perfect in every single way. You and I have never had yeah. that conversation. No, no, we have no. not. But no, you've, you've never told me nice. that. I've never told you that. It's no, no. 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 Mm-hmm. no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's what friends do for each other but i mean it's just i relate to the avienda so much there just that like oh i'm never gonna be good enough i'm never gonna be able to do the right things i do yeah. love the mistake where she's like i mean i would totally torture her i just don't know how <laughs> <laughs> yeah that misunderstanding is like yeah no you aren't completely identical twins no, yet no you still you still <laughs> you never will be very different cultural backgrounds where you know they're both like i couldn't i can't do it oh i couldn't do it either yeah, I don't know how. What? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't think she would succeed at it. Mm-hmm. I think that the maidens having the rule of you can't even watch until you've been a warrior for 10 years proves that she would be as inept as Elaine at doing mm-hmm. it. But yeah, their approaches to the situation are nonetheless hilariously different. Mm-hmm. So and then we have the conversation where she gives her this week this, uh, on Grial, and she's like twice as much. Uh, do we know, do all those Angriol end up back with Elaine? What ends up happening with those Angriol? I think Avienda keeps hers, Nynaeve keeps hers, and then Talon gives hers back. And it ends up uh, being with Nynaeve, and Olivia uses it during the cleansing of Sidene. There's also the, this lovely line of, uh, <laughs> you're about as weak and soft as a stone. That had to be the oddest compliment she had ever paid anyone, yet Avienda actually looked gratified. <laughs> It's adorable. I love it. I love their relationship. They're so, they're they're funny. So just from Crossroads of Twilight and Knife of Dreams, it appears that the Amber Brooch and the Seated Woman are just sort of like both Avienda and Elaine just sort of grab it because they're together. It's just in storage with them. And then we learn that Nynaeve has the character flaw of having a bad head for heights, which I love. She's so strong, but she gets seasick and she has a bad head for heights. <laughs> Yeah, I love that that she can be so uh, emotionally strong while at the same time physically very vulnerable to things like that. And she doesn't let that affect the fact. She's like, no, that doesn't make me vulnerable at all. I'm still just as badass. Which she is. And then she starts apologizing to Elaine and being like, I'm a fool. Please tell me when I'm acting stupid. I'm losing my wits in a man. Like, <laughs> like, She's just giddy and doesn't know how to deal with it. And it's a really bad time for her to be giddy. And she knows it. And it's And Elaine's just like, it, what are you saying right now? I mean, I, I think in a lot of ways there she's like, I'm, I've experienced, we talked about this, I've experienced sex for the first time, right? Like, I think that's my, that's really what she's talking about. Mm-hmm. Now, whether whether the writing is great around that, that that is sort of what he's implying is like... Well, and getting to be, like, fully in love. Not unrequited distance love, but, like, you're doing it, you're doing it, and you're getting all the time together. Yeah, it's a very big difference, and she's absolutely giddy and over the moon, and it's it's the worst possible time for her to be that kind of distracted. You don't know what it's like, though. I'm sorry. Elaine offers comfort from wisdom she doesn't have. <laughs> they have different kinds of lovesick. 
going on. She does, though. I, I like this. I've been behaving like a fool. Although she doesn't immediately turn around and say, it's that bloody man's fault. Mm-hmm. <laughs> not, not right in front of me. I can hardly think of anything else. When he is, I can hardly think at all. <laughs> Sometimes it was difficult to tell Nynaeve leading from Nynaeve bullying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because she's like apologizing, and then she's like, "Okay, give me an angry girl. Let's go. Let's go do this." Like she's because she turns around, she says, "Stop apologizing and do what you came here to do. Lead." And she's like, "Fine. All right, you now." <laughs> like, yeah, it's it's, it's her only mode. wonderful. Yeah. But yeah, then the whole thing about Talon not getting time to get her angry all taught to her is just like such sticklers for rank. It's so annoying. There is a lot of weirdness here where it's like, okay, we're gonna introduce everyone to Angriol for the first time, introduce everyone to Linking for the first time, and then we're going to go ahead and do the most, like, important thing in the world? It's like, maybe practice one or two weaves first? I don't know. And, like, no trust-building exercises between these women who are going to be bound up into this incredibly important thing. And, like, yeah, you can't be driven to dying, but still, you'd think that, like, a trust fall or two would go a long way towards, like, team unity. (laughs) So yeah, no, there's this. It's just forged together. And they're just like, all right, let's bang these things together. And okay, it's I know it's lumpy, but it works. Okay, go. And there is a sense of urgency with the timing. There is, there is. So I, I, I get that. But like, whew. and and there is a certain amount of like inexperience on Nynaeve and Elaine's part, where like they themselves are inexperienced at this, and they're basically she's like covering for the fact that Nynaeve can't really pass control that easily and has her own you know they're doing a lot of smoke and mirrors to make this work and to look like they know what they're doing when in reality they're flying by the seat of their pants as much as anybody mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and kyra is very rude and imposing mm-hmm. and pompous that's basically what she does do- is, i know everything and i'm a badass and i'm driving this ship do we ever get like a story about her that's interesting um it's more of world building out what the sea folk are like when Talon kind of explains the family dynamics of why she wants to run away to the tower. She kind of gives a little bit of context to the family dynamics and that lets you sort of see the sea folk. But again, it's a lot like Elise. It's just what it says on the tin. There's nothing right. really interesting happening there, in my opinion. Yeah, I'm looking at what, what her story after this and it's. Carrie and the other Windfinders. Carrie and the other Windfinders. Carrie and the other Windfinders. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, she just leads. She's the cranky pants leader. Nynaeve demonstrates the shielding on Talon as Zyda and the six Windfinders. You know, so there's just no... Zyda calls a meeting of the first 12 and they're Windfinders. Yeah, there's zero reference of her doing anything independently at all after the, the cleansing. Which is just, it's amazing for someone who leads the cleansing, which seems to be this super important role. And they just, yep, yep, that's it. They're they're gone after that. Yeah, no one the tr- Siva get a very raw deal on page time, given how critical they are at this moment. I'd even like to see, like, a Forsaken take revenge and be like, oh, yeah, because, like, there's a dark friend present, so I'm sure they reported back, you know, who led everything. Like, I'd love to see her just be like, oh, she was killed. Like, even on off a, a single line of, like, she was killed in revenge for, uh, or Forsaken being like, I took out the one who led that circle. Right, like that would be a cool one off liner. No, nope. she's just one of the many sea folk that helped with the last battle using the bowl or something. Yeah, and she's just a basic political climber who's got lots of power in sea folk society and has a lot of animosity towards her daughter and her sister. And and happens to have studied the right thing. Yeah, she happens to be a specialist scholar in this particular thing. So she's well qualified to uh drive the bull of the winds with a circle of 13 linked women with Angriol to try to literally change the weather with a device that's meant to be used in concert with several other devices, but is in fact just being used by itself. And it's a very incredible feat that actually spits in the dark one's eye quite effectively. And I feel like the next chunk is a bit of how a knowledge dump on how circles work and how circles work with Angriol. And how to form yep. them, and it just it walks us through that whole process. And how embracing the source is hard to hold mm-hmm. on to, or hard to stay at the edge of, which is just an exceedingly over-sexualized paragraph. <laughs> it's very sexualized. She's just edging that <laughs> whole time. Yeah. She's like, hey, I gotta come. <laughs> like, that's basically yeah, what's just... going on. <laughs> and she's yeah. panting, and it's just like, you just did that in front of everybody. <laughs> right? 
right? I mean, this okay. is why, like, when I talk about embracing the source as being, like, an orgasm, like, I, I've talked about that many times, and it's paragraphs that, like, this one that makes me go, yeah, like, I'm not, <laughs> That's like, yeah, I'm not making this up. I'm not bringing this out of, you know, whole cloth. I'm not doing it to be funny. I'm like, that's literally what he's putting on the page. Yeah. <laughs> which part of me enjoys and part of me hates. Like, I can't decide how I feel about it, which means it's good writing. Right. And, and I mean, because so much of this story is about the male female dynamic, of course, the power is going to be centered around sex. Yeah. Have you read Anne Rand? Anne Rand. Sorry. Anne, Anne Rice. Rice. Thank you. <laughs> that was the Anne I was expecting. <laughs> and I'm like, how? I have not read Anne Rand, so I'm not, maybe I'm missing something, but I have, I have read Anne have Rice. read Anne Rice because, yes, very <laughs> over sexualized vampire power. That's what I was going for. Not over sexualized libertarianism. Uh, <laughs> I, I have, actually, that, that actually is a really good description of Atlas Shrugged over sexualized libertarianism i you know oh really yeah oh yeah <laughs> i'm disturbed that that disturbs me oh and chat agrees I i'm bothered so uh there's a bunch of distrust from the sea folk about Lincoln. right yeah and, and and i did want to reference that yes the white tower studied for ages and determined there was no way to do a link against your will the sean chan they came up with a way well, and there's also the line, what was in the pages that had not survived? Right. She had noticed a slight change in Saritha's inflection at one right. point. Right. With nothing was in the pages, but maybe the word of mouth, maybe something that they heard about. Maybe something that was worked out some right. other way, or something that was left orally that used to be in the pages, but isn't in the pages now. Like, there's a lot of ways that could go. Um, but yeah, it's a bunch of mistrust and a bunch of explanation. Blah, blah, blah. Exposition, 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 exposition. Nynaeve has a hard time relinquishing control. Shocking revelation. Elaine's awareness goes high because she's cranked full of the power. And it's amazing. Nynaeve is horny. <laughs> Garini and Kirstian are terrified. Kyra is as stubborn as Nynaeve and is bad with control. <laughs> and rips it out of Elaine's hands. Like, that's the next two pages. Is, that's it's just summarizing happens. everybody's emotions at the moment in which they bond. And so th this is a little bit of like a preview of parents smelling chapters. Right, mm -hmm. where you just you have pages and pages of him just describing the emotions of every single character on page, and you know it it can be fun to follow if you're interested in what those characters are doing or if those characters have any significance to the story whatsoever. But I mean, we don't we just don't get enough from these characters for me to care what they what, how they how they're feeling. And then we get one of the most visually stunning parts mm -hmm. of the series, which is this page and a half description of the bull of the winds actually being used which i really hope they keep this in the show because it's oh my god the visuals are just a writhing braided column of sidar shoots up into the sky the bowl is drawing sidine as well as sidar so you've got the spikes and the curly cues and the voids and the glowy parts and then do you think this is worth a read just this big long chunk of using the bowl honestly it's so yeah, good i'll just give it a read at that moment, Kyra drew deeply. Sidar flooded through Elaine, almost as much as she could hold. An unbroken ring of light blazed into being, joining the women in the circle, brighter whenever one used an angriol, but nowhere faint. She watched closely as Kyrie channeled, forming a complex weave of all five powers. A four-pointed star that she laid atop the bowl, with what Elaine somehow was sure was exquisite precision. The star touched, and Elaine gasped. Once, she had channeled a trickle into the bowl, in Teleron Riyadh, to be sure, and only a reflection of the bowl, though still a dangerous thing to do. And that clear crystal had turned a pale blue, and the carved clouds moved. Now the bowl of the winds was blue, the bright blue of a summer sky, and fleecy white clouds billowed across it. The four-pointed star became five-pointed, the composition of the weave altered slightly, and the bowl was a green sea with great heaving waves. Five points became six, and it was another sky, a different blue, darker, winter perhaps, with purple clouds heavy with rain or snow. Seven points, and a gray-green sea raged in storm. Eight points, in sky. Nine, and sea. And suddenly, Elaine felt the bowl itself drawing Sidar a wild torrent far greater than all the circle together could manage. The changes continued unabated inside the bowl, sea to sky, weaves to clouds, 
But a writhing, braided column of Sidar shot up from that flattish crystal disk. Fire and air, water and earth and spirit. A column of intricate lace as wide as the bowl, climbing up and up into the sky until its top rose out of sight. Kyra continued her weaving, sweat streaming down her face. She paused seemingly only to blink salty drops away from her eyes as she examined the images in the bowl, and then laid a new weave. The pattern of the braiding in the thick column altered with the every weave, subtly echoing what Kyra wove. I'm going to stop there. So cool. And I love the start of the four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pointed stars that clearly she's mm-hmm. building something. She's creating. She's like, this is what the weather should be. She's going through each season for sky and ocean. Gotcha. And it's another star each time. And I think it's must cycle over at okay, some point. It, well, you, you, we start with Or maybe it just four. keeps going up. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's six different stars she lays down. Maybe there's like six seasons the way that the sea folk reckon weather. So let's see. Four is sky. Five is sea. Six is sky. Seven is sea. Eight is sky. Nine is sea. Yeah. So it's alternating sea and sky. And you start start with summer, winter, and we don't know what the last one. But I'm guessing that they're getting away from summer because that's what they're stuck in. So I'm guessing... She's cycling the three other seasons. Yeah, the three other seasons. Yeah, basically, like, let's kick up, let's kickstart these three other seasons. That makes sense. And so we get a description of how they feel inside. And then there's another description of it that I want to read because it's more cool visual shit. Go for it. From Kyra came only determination, as steely hard as her expression. Nothing was going to stand in Kyra's way. Certainly not the mere presence of shadow-tainted Sidene mixed into her weaving. Nothing was going to stop her. She worked the flows, and abruptly spiderwebs of Sidar blossomed from the unseen top of the column, like uneven spokes of a wheel, almost a solid fan to the south, sparser fans reaching north and northwest, single lacy spokes stretching in other directions. They changed as they grew, never the same from one moment to the next, spreading across the sky, farther and farther, until the ends of the pattern also passed out of sight. Not just Sidar, not just Sidar there either, Elaine was certain. In places that spiderweb caught and curved around something she could not see. Still Kyra wove, and the column danced to her bidding, Sidar and Sidine together, and the spiderweb altered and flowed like a lopsided kaleidoscope spinning across the heavens, vanishing into the distance, on and on and on. That's so cool this lopsided kaleidoscope like it's a very psychedelic image honestly <laughs> i sort of think about like being in a planetarium and like someone turns on the laser lights mm. yeah i can imagine doing acid and watching this whole thing going on in the sky that would be pretty cool yeah it's uh it's really trippy and it's interesting that it's not even in all directions i like that like there's more that go to the south like i don't quite know like why it goes lopsidedly in different directions but something to do with the geography of the planet and where the weather systems need to be and where the gulf scr- or the jet stream is and all that kind of stuff i kind of assumed it was cuz they're in the northern hemisphere so right, you have exactly. more th- i mean but technically you're on a globe so shouldn't they all go you equally in all directions right like but maybe it has to do with the the, the spin i think it has to do with where the weather is most distorted i think the most power is going to where the pattern of the world is the most like snag you think that's in the south by the dark one i would think that would be in the north yeah because it's summer oh uh, okay so i'm like summer is a south a heat like that somehow they have to, it has to go like kick the south in the face like kick the heat back well, and we did talk about maybe it's something. the tilt of the planet that that's the fixing the season so maybe to re-tilt the planet you have to like push the south away from the sun or something like that yeah you have to rotate it Back more to the north. Yeah, totally. That could be it. But I, I like that he's not just like, it's even in all directions. It's like, and the, their position on the planet is factoring into where the spokes are going and where they're positioned. And then they just let go of the circle and Elaine hates it <laughs> because it's very abrupt. There should have been a little bit of like off ramping to that. It's, it would be like uh, ending a podcast without music or something like that. It's just like right. A, it's just like <laughs> well, okay, we're done. Yeah, or like slamming on the brakes at the end of a, a car ride. Or, yep, it's rude. So the things they did, they severely overtaxed this. Right? They had Angrial, they had a full circle, and they gave it just ridiculously big ropes of power. Right? That's what that's what the sh- that's what the sea folk do 
that no one has ever been able to do before, which is create large flows, individual flows. Um, and so that combination has really overtaxed the one power in the local area. And that becomes a thing. <laughs> because the weirdness. the weirdness and it's it's really subtle and it's something that I think I missed the first couple of read throughs because a lot of times it's from Rand's POV and he's got so many things going on with the crossing of the streams that happened basically at the exact same time right that's the last time we saw him he crossed streams so the next time we see him he both has the cross streams effect and some of the Ebu Dar effect and so it's very hard to distinguish what's going on. But this this crackling, this overtaxing of the one power actually leads to this effect where, like, it doesn't do what they want and then suddenly snaps into place. Right? We see that a lot with some of the, the, the weaving and stuff like that. There's just a lot of... And we have it confirmed that it was the use of the bowl of the winds that caused that. And it is most highly pronounced around the loca the farm, right? The location where they use the bull the winds. But it is also actually around where those big ropes went out. Those linear ropes. Like if you if that rope crossed your space, you also have the effect in that area. So that's why mm. it's spread out across the whole continent. It's not just centralized. It's actually where those ropes spread across the entire continent. Because it's actually changing like the nature of reality to a certain exactly. extent. And that's taxing the one power which makes up everything. Just just a, just smidge. a smidge. Just it's it's like Thor like drinking out of the horn enough to actually create tides. Mm. It's like it's a smidge, but it's significant. Yeah, and then Nynaeve says, I feel like a kitchen sieve that just had the whole mill poured through it. And I'm like, just you wait until the cleansing. <laughs> And then you're going to pass out and not wake up for three days. <laughs> right. Yeah, you think you, you've you been used roughly now. Just wait. Yeah, you think you used a lot of power now. Wait until you've cleansed the entire mass of Sidene. Oh, I just wanted to read one more thing. When they turn off the, the power, the bowl turned clear again, but small patches of Sidar flashed and crackled around its edges. That, I think, is representing... That's like after they're done using it, it's still crackling. And as we said, the bowl mm -hmm. is a representative of the world of the sky upside down. Right? So around the edges mm -hmm. would be like all around the edge. The, the horizon. horizon. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And then it fades from that. They think that they're still just feeling that into feeling the Sean Chan attack, right. which is confusing. Right. <laughs> yeah. They're they're all very happy about it. Avienda says in Maiden Hand Talk, more than worth the price. I thought this was funny that like trying to convince people that the climate is changing is difficult as it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> and this is she's like no it is getting better i did it and everyone's like yeah it's still hot outside and she's like well yeah it's not gonna get cold instantly and i yeah it didn't mm -hmm. i feel like we were str struggling from the opposite effect of being like yeah all the co2 we're pumping in the atmosphere is gonna heat things up and be like well it's not hot right now we're turning the rudder on a ship and even this is one of the things that uh really drives me nuts about the co2 discussion when people are like oh well if we get to net zero by 2050 we'll be fine i'm like no you've turned the rudder on the ship even at yeah. net zero things are still going to keep getting hotter long after you stop releasing carbon dioxide yeah we have to sequester we need we need negative progress yeah that's that's a thing <laughs> i think it's funny that naive is the one that doesn't get that She's the village wisdom. She used to like listen to the wind professionally. She is the one person who shouldn't be confused about the difference between weather and climate. I do think she gets it. I think she's just like, nope, not giving you anything. You can't prove it. Like, I think there's a little bit of just bar bargaining in there as well. Like, I think she doesn't get it because it's her job not to get it. <sighs> to be like, you haven't proven it. Like, it's not. She doesn't know for sure that the weather has changed. True. And I mean, I totally agree with her that they should have to hang out until it's obvious that something has happened and that will take a while the sea folk are not correct to be grabbing the bowl and saying we did right. it it's like mm -mm, no, mm -mm, no. they might need to be adjustments like no it will take a minute you just said so yourself you stay for a minute that's actually something i, I wondered about is why don't it seems like they could travel and use it again and then travel and use it again it seems like that would be helpful to like use it in multiple places to to they don't have this many strong women to work with and they're all exhausted there's no way they could do this again Without getting several good sleeps, I think. Well, okay, but yeah, do that. But yeah, but then they're busy with like running away from the Shan Chan and Fair. shit. I can almost feel an echo of Sidar, and I think that echo is just them channeling the the Shan Chan channeling. Yeah, this this yeah. is now. First, there was the crackler in the edge of the bowl, and then there's the faint feel of channeling from Ebudar, and they bleed right into each other. 
But yeah, that is the attack on Ebudar starting. And they have to shuffle their plans very, very quickly. Do you think the use of the Bowl of the Winds caused the Shan Chan to start their attack? Do you think that they saw these big power things going across the sky and they're like, holy shit, whatever that is, we're going, we need to attack now before they do something. Because like they were clearly prepping to attack, but attacking at that moment seems to have been caused, I mean, by the big signal. I can't imagine it wasn't related. I'd never thought of that before until you asked, but yeah, they're they're getting ready. They're sneaking up. They're loading their gunpowder. And then suddenly there's power in the sky. Like, okay, I guess we're not waiting for the signal from the generals because that is the signal. Oh, I mean, Nynaeve and Talon, who's just as powerful. So two of Forsaken level channelers with Angriol in a group of 13, right? The more power that's been used almost any time, except when Rand used Kalendor or... Because he hasn't really used the Choden Call yet. Yeah, no. This is probably the most power that's been used in 3,000 years. And they don't think to warn anybody about what it was. Like, the amount of people on their side who are scared shitless by this. I mean, same with the cleansing. More so with the cleansing. Same with the cleansing. But this foreshadows that, like, you should really send out a memo. (laughs) Like, save the date. (laughs) <laughs> I'm going to be ripping reality just slightly for a repair on Tuesday at three. Can they just form a discord server to sort of organize all this and tell our own reality? Honestly, yeah. they really need a discord server. Just, yeah. just a little pocket reality that you can use to. Yeah, yeah. You can just put a Google or a doodle poll into it. You know, I like... mean, they do figure out how to leave messages. They say that they can throw down an inverted weave and it stays there for a while. So it seems like you should, you know, be able to create forum posts in in tell running yeah. out for folks. Yeah, we just have an auto archive. Oh right, I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry. We're not allowed to have our characters communicate in this story. That would ruin it. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. Yeah, no, not in my wheel of time. Nope, we don't have communication. That that's that's the three book version of wheel of time where the characters all communicate. Yeah. Right. Yeah, which would be very bad business model for us. <laughs> <laughs> would have finished this podcast ages ago. So yeah, they decide that they have to all skedaddle. Nynaeve is like, I'm going to go get Matt. And Elaine's like, no, you aren't. You're fucking exhausted and there's an entire army. You cannot go back for him. They don't have any reason to hurt him. We just, we got to bail. They'll collar us otherwise. Like, there's, they initially assume it's Forsaken, right? That much power, it's got to be Forsaken. They're coming for us. You know, it's got to be Mogedian at, at, at all, right? In company. And they're like, they're like, huh, well, that sucks. And then they realize, because there's a rockin', that it's the Sean Chan. And then they really panic. <laughs> right. It's the, the panic over the Sean Chan is much, much greater than the panic over the Forsaken. Because they can handle Forsaken. They cannot handle the Sean Chan. Yeah, totally. It's, it's, it's a very different, very different animal. And there's a great line here that people may recognize from another character. The Rose Crown is heavier than a mountain. And duty will make you weep, but you must bear and do it. Do it must be done. Duty is heavier than a mountain. Clearly used across many continents and countries in different references. And I can see where that that Borderlander saying would get into Andor and become the Rose Crown is heavier than a mountain rather than duty is heavier than a mountain. The Rose Crown is your duty. Her her conviction to her duty to rule is one of the things I don't get about her. I have a hard time with the whole I have a right to rule thing. I just don't grok that whole perspective but i get that she's very committed to it i mean she was raised that way right in a, in a country where queens have ruled hereditarily for you know a thousand years and she's not wrong that she'd be a, she's a better ruler than some of the other people out there it's, it's true now do i think she should have given it to dylan and gone off to go adventuring yes <laughs> <laughs> it would have been a lot simpler but again we'd have a shorter series she'd chosen that so so yeah they they abandoned and this is the split between matt matt is sent to go get elaine that was the whole point of him being here was to protect her and uh be with her and be with them it's interesting that he doesn't go with them to this because of Alver. it's because of Alver. that's why the party has split oh he because he yeah. goes to get all all of her he's like i'll catch you oh, up guess, yeah. on the road it'll be fine and then the sean chan attack before he can find Alver. But it's all Oliver's fault that the party has split. But this is when the split becomes permanent rather than short term. And this is also when the sea folk get disconnected from their ships, like our the particular cast we see. Renata even says here, like, my ship fights for his life and I am not on his deck. 
her and her group are all these windfinders are cut off and they're saved from the shan chain but they're cut off from their people from their ships they're very unmoored for a long time and in a lot of ways because all these powerful the most powerful sea folk channelers aren't on their ships there's not really a lot of resistance to the the shan chan the shan chan may not have taken ebudar as easily if they had had to fight a bunch of sea folk channelers on their ships who could have absolutely uh fought back it's kind of like the strike at shao ghoul right like the 13 most powerful are off and away like isolated from everything else it, it's a bummer for them it really sucks for them they become refugees in this moment they were just on a field trip and now they are refugees and she's like i'm gonna take a, a gateway out of here and elaine's like first of all you literally can't second of all that makes no sense don't do that especially since if uh, someone who had been in the circle, they probably would... Again, this is the sort of fuzzy rules around learning a space mm -hmm. and, and how to... I, I do like that we get to see what happens if you try and form a gateway and you don't know the area. The whole, like, mm -hmm. un falling apart thing. Yeah. That was cool. Like, what actually happens if you try? I, I actually... I really like the fire the sea folk does at the Rockin. The sea folk, who made no throwing gesture as part of their weaving... A hail of fire so thick it seemed the fire must be forming itself out of the air. And just like oh, uh, that, yeah. that like just massive thread of fire that just the whole thing becomes fire rather than like. Yeah, it seems just like a sheet of fire just like materializing in the air like it's being like snapped in, in the breeze. I thought that was cool. Oh, that, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I had totally skipped past this. Like, and then they attack it, whatever. But that's a cool description. Because the sea folk have those thick, thick weaves yeah yeah they they don't fuck around they don't do small power things <laughs> now they missed they kill one yeah and they push the other one there's a scene later on where you get to get into the head of one of the people on this rockin and one falls off they get hit by the shockwave and the rockin starts to tumble i thought that was the explosion of the gateway oh shit you're that's right that's not this you're yeah, right that's a different that's rocket. Not this. you're right it's, at this, it's at this spot for almost these reasons, right. but you're right. That's the I think this one from the or is, is it, big bada boom. Is it these this rockin though? I think it is this rockin. Yeah, they dodged the fire once, and now they're being careful. So yeah, I think I think it's the same. We'll have to verify one. that. Okay, when we so get to I'm, it. I'm only partially. <laughs> Shuellen moved the rain slightly, and Sagani banked smoothly. So Sagani is the name of the rockin. Mm -hmm. He was well trained. At least the smoke had stopped rising from where Tuan and Maku had died in the Olive Grove. So that's the one that they hit. So that does imply that she was the other one because she saw it and was like, oh, it could have been me. Although now that I, I, I look at this again, it does seem like they were in the second wave that showed up. Well, I guess it would make sense, actually, that the one would like zip out and go back and get more. Mm -hmm. Get more. And sh the, like this one knows who died, but it's not... It's not clear, it's not obvious one way or the other whether she is or is not from the reading. It's like, she could be, but it definitely doesn't make it obvious. She doesn't reference, like, when they threw a fireball at me or anything like that. Okay. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> headcanon accordingly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely going to be a headcanon moment, just because I think there's no proof one way or the other. So, if you if you want it to be the same Torakan, you can make it if you don't want it. If you want it to be one that showed up with the rest of the troops, it could be as well. Renyla strode up with the bowl in her arms, once more swathed in its white covering. Some of our ships have encountered the Shan Chan. If they are in Ebudar, then the ships beat to sea. My ship fights for his life, and I am not on his deck. We go now. And she formed the weave for a gateway, right there. It tangled uselessly, of course. Flared bright for an instant, then collapsed into nothing. But Elaine squeaked in spite of herself. Right there in the middle of them? You aren't going anywhere from here unless you mean to stay long enough to learn this hilltop, she snapped. She hoped none of the women who had been in the circle tried the weave. Holding Sidara was the fastest way to learn a place. She could have made it work here, and very likely so could they. You aren't going to a moving ship from anywhere. I don't even think it's possible. Mirella nodded, though that meant little. I said I believed a great many things to be true, and some of them actually were. As well if the sea folk believed it proven. In any case, Nynaeve... Haggard and staring, was in no condition to do any leading at the moment, so Elaine went on. She hoped she managed to do her mother's memory proud. But most of all, you aren't going anywhere except with us, because our bargain isn't complete. The Bowl of the Winds is not yours until the weather is right. 
Not precisely true, unless you twisted the words of the bargain a little, and Renyla opened her mouth, but Elaine plowed on. And because you made a bargain with Matram Cawthon, my subject. You go voluntarily where I want you, or you go tied to a pack saddle. Those were the choices you accepted. So get down this hill now, Renyla D. Colin Blue Star, before the Sean Chan sweep down on us with an army and a few hundred women who can channel and would like nothing better than to see us collared alongside them. Now, run! To her astonishment, they ran. Renyla D. Colin Blue Star? <laughs> Din Cal- Co- Calon? Din Callan. Callan is how they say it in the audiobooks. And Colin? I mean, she's such an asshole. I'm going with it. <laughs> I approve. I approve. It's not a correction. Mm-hmm. It's a comment. <laughs> it's perfect. Arnila Din Colon with a blue star on the end of it. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> She's basically a cat with a star butthole. It's you're, you're not wrong. Yeah. You're not wrong. See, the sea folk are generally cats. That's yeah. I just imagine them as a group of, of cats. Yeah, they've got that swaying. I mean, walk. way more water into it. Way more into water than most yeah, cats are. Yeah, but a are. lot of them they can't even. You know, so maybe they they don't even swim. They stay on their ships. I think they can all. I think swim. they can too. We see her dump. <laughs> we do see Nynaeve dump a bunch of them in the water. And or is it, yeah, and Egwene does. Or, or Egwene, I mean, they can all. Sw- yeah. yeah, they can all swim. Okay, so so my cat analogy <laughs> doesn't work great, but. But there are some cats that love swimming. That's true. And have made that part of their habitat, like in mm-hmm. South America. There are cats that swim as part of their hunting, like, thing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and I think snow leopards mm-hmm. also maybe go into hot springs. But I feel like this is very much about herding cats. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, they're finicky and persnickety and just show you their buttholes all the time. So, hooray, we are out of summer, endless summer. We now... <gasps> No longer have to reference every chapter, starting off with it being hot and dry and unseasonable. Now we get all these little references to, oh, a wind, and it was breaking, and a drizzle, and first bits of green, and then all of a sudden, freezing cold and snow, and oh god, it's cold, because it's the middle of winter, and it's been the middle of winter for a couple of months now. Yeah, and that will match well with our transition from summer into, into winter. winter yes yeah no it actually works out very well with we're us. we're recording this mid-october so summer's over and winter is starting to make itself known on the horizon we did transition very well into that we did most of the last book in an unseasonably warm summer and we're going to do most of mm-hmm. this book in, a, in in the in the transition and then into the winter we're going to be doing this book all through the winter especially because of the pause that the show's going to put in it we're really going to be doing well this book through the winter and then I don't know when we're going to get to Winter's Heart. It'll probably be fucking summer again, but... Yeah, it's, we, you can't always be on. It is always fun when the wet weather matches the book you're reading. We, we got a lot of the nasty summer shit during, like, I mean, we were doing hot chapters during the yep. heat wave. Like, I mean, we got a good lineup on that, so... And, yeah, we will see you in the next chapter, which is... One week from one today. One week from today. And this is the Exploding Gateway, and we will be joined by our guest... Kayla, who won the slot at SpoilerCon. At SpoilerCon. So, really excited to have um, Big Kayla Big bada Yeah, we're going to... I think this is, a, this is a fun chapter. This one might actually be more fun than the old wins use itself, even though that had so much more lead up to it. Yeah, and having talked with Kayla at SpoilerCon, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Definitely. She's She's going to have fun with Big bada <laughs> Alright, well thank you so much for coming, and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. got a couple of things about the show uh over the last couple of days we got the yes, we poster uh the puzzle mm-hmm. poster of which we got the most important piece which was lands <laughs> lands leg where it touched moraine so we got a piece of her cloak and his like vertical leg yeah we got both of them in our puzzle piece so we're basically the coolest totally we yeah the best definitely piece. the best piece and that was sent to us by, I woke up at like 7.30 a.m. to a text message or from um, a DM on Twitter from the official Wheel of Time thing with a puzzle piece and a, and a bit of a poem with it. And I was immediately retweeted it and then went back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> talk, to, talk to a radio briefly.
Yeah, I was like, is this a thing? He's like, yes. I'm like, are you going to do the retweets? He's like, yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> I, I don't, is Twitter thing? I don't, I don't Twitter. I, I very erratically Twitter. But it was fun to see everybody scramble and put the pieces together and try and assemble the poster and then get the actual poster that was uh, Moraine dragging a, what appears to be a dead Trolloc by the hair. And which is mm-hmm. just like it's so real badass. badass. It's it's I think... <laughs> it's like so they're establishing her as a warrior mm-hmm. mage, like without a doubt. Lands back there, like should I get my sword out or do you got like, this? Nah, yeah, I'm good. You're good. <laughs> really good poster. And then we got a sort of extensive little clip narrated by Moraine. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, I did with the shadow spawn. The whole like more of a look at the shadow spawn, which was mostly just fast cut editing, but still, it was more monster shots. And it was mostly shots we've already seen, but extended, right? Like we'd seen a picture of the the Forsaken with the Trollocs behind it, but this was like five seconds of that shot of them moving around. Yeah, and you know, it was. It's been very cool how they've given us just the same moments over and over again, and they're just extending it out by a little bit. And like, I see them doing it, and I'm a little resentful that we're not getting more. But I also think it's kind of brilliant because it's just so addictively exciting to be like, oh, I got an extra thirty mm-hmm. or an extra point three seconds. It's like, yes, it's they're they're playing us like fish, like fiddles. <laughs> fish fiddles. I get the feeling we'll know a lot of what's going on in episode one by the time it drops. Agreed. We're gonna have seen most but of it, but very already. little beyond that. And since we're seeing three episodes in one night, that's not gonna be a big. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about yeah. that. So. Basically, episode one is the teaser right. trailer, and they're just giving to, to us in little dribbles. And I'm, it's working for me. I'm excited. You know, some stuff excites me more than others, but I'm still overall beyond over the moon excited about everything. Like that, that's I'm, we're only like a month away. I don't have enough credit with my friends to force them to read Wheel of Time, but I do have enough credit with my friends to force them to watch it. So I can't (laughs) wait until I get to that point. God, I I can't believe the finale is Christmas Eve. I'm going to be like with my parents. I don't know what the hell I'm going to. I guess I'm just going to force my whole family to watch the whole show that day so we can watch the finale. Best of luck with that. The kids should be be old enough now. (laughs) Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?